Red Badge of Courage, Chapter 15. Um, Henry has woken up at his regiment, has had breakfast. He's talking with Wilson about the battle and the, you know, what's going on. Uh, and he just told his friend that Jim Conklin's dead. I think that's enough of a recap for you. Uh, chapter 15. Guns were always to be heard, filling the air with a thundering sound. This part of the world was strange and never without battle. The youth regiment marched again. The men took positions behind a curving line of rifles along the edge of the forest. Before them was a flat place filled with broken tree trunks. From the forest beyond came the dull noise of soldiers firing. From the right came a noise of the first battle. The men sat quietly awaiting their turn. Many had their backs to the fighting. The youth's friend lay down, buried his face in his arms, and almost instantly it seemed he was in a deep sleep. The youth leaned his breast against the brown earth and gazed over at the forest up and down the line. Trees cut off his view. He could see only a short distance. A few idle flags were placed on the earth and hills. Behind them were rows of dark figures with a few heads looking curiously over the tops. Always the noise of fighting came from the forest to the front and to the left and the battle on the right had grown fr to frightful size. The guns were roaring without an instant's pause for breath. Before the sun was bright, the regiment was moving carefully through the forest. The hurrying lines of the enemy could sometimes be seen through the trees and little fields. The enemy soldiers were shouting and happy. At this sight, the youth forgot personal matters and became greatly angered. He shouted in loud sentences, We're being led by a lot of fools, by God. More than one fellow has said that today, declared a man. Wilson, recently awakened, was still very sleepy. He looked behind him until his mind took in the meaning of the movement. Then he sighed, Oh, well, I suppose we're beaten, he remarked sadly. Well, don't we fight like the devil? Don't we do all that men can, demanded the youth loudly. That's ironic, too. Like, no, he hasn't fought like the devil. He hasn't even fought, really, except that one battle. In his reply, the friend's voice was firm. No man dares say we don't fight like the devil. No man will ever dare say it. The boys fight like hell, but still, still, we don't have any luck. Well, then, if we fight like the devil and we don't ever win, it must be the general's fault, the youth said, and grandly and decidedly. And I don't see any sense in fighting and fighting and fighting, and yet always losing because of some f old fool of a general. Um, now, we never mentioned the general's name, but it, it's um, fighting Joe Hooker, if you go back and, and remember what's going on. And actually, it's, it's sort of ironic if you know the history that fighting Joe Hooker was uh, at the Chancellorsville mansion when a pillar got blown up by a cannonball, struck him in the head, and he had a concussion. Um, and here's Henry having the same sort of thing happen. So if you're a student in history, I guess it's just sort of a, an interesting irony of the story itself. The words cut the youth. Oh, sorry. I, I skipped a line. A man who was walking at the youth's side then spoke slowly. Maybe you think you fought the whole battle yesterday, Fleming, he remarked. The words cut the youth. Within, he was reduced to nothing by the speech. His legs shook. He gave a frightened glance at the man. Well, no, he hurried to say. I don't think I fought the whole battle yesterday. But the man seemed to have no deeper meaning. Apparently, he had no information. It was merely his habit to speak this way. Oh, he replied in the same tone. The youth nevertheless felt a threat. His mind refused to go nearer to the danger, and thereafter he was silent. The man's words took from him all he thought of saying anything that would make him noticeable. He became suddenly a quiet person. There was a low-toned talk among the troops. The officers were impatient and angry, their faces clouded with the tales of bad luck. The troops coming through the forest were sad. In the youth's regiment, once a man's laugh rang out, a dozen soldiers turned their faces quickly toward him in blame. In a clear space, the troops were at last stopped. Regiments and brigades broken by battle grew together again and lines were formed toward the enemy. Good God, the youth complained. We're always being led around like dogs. It makes me sick. Nobody seems to know where to go or why we go. Where we go or why we go. Um, yeah, given, given what he did yesterday, that's kind of ironic too. At this time, there was a flood of speech from the young lieutenant who felt obligated to place some of his own unhappiness upon his men. You boys keep quiet. There's no need to waste your breath in long-winded arguments about this and that and the other. You've been screaming like a lot of old chickens. 
All you have to do is fight, and you'll get plenty of that to do in about ten minutes. I never heard such foolish talking, he said to them, turning his head for a final remark. There was a wait. The strained moments that go before a battle pass slowly. In the regiment, a strange kind of hesitation could be seen in the attitude of the men. They were tired and weak, having slept little and labored much. They rolled their eyes toward the advancing battle as they stood, waiting for the shock, waiting to be hit. So it sounds like the Confederates are about to advance on their position. Um, Henry has returned to his regiment. He fled last time. Let's see what happens next time. Uh, so he's going into combat again. Is he a changed man? Is something different about him? We'll see.